Today we arrive at Psalm 103. And it's been really helpful for us preaching through the Psalms because the Psalms are God's songbook that He wrote to us that press into all of our emotions that we feel as Christians. I mean, everything from laments, for example, you know, half of the Psalms are lament Psalms because life's hard. In this series here from Psalm 103 to 106, we have a series of praise hymns where we praise and celebrate the Lord that all He has promised us and all He is doing. And the Psalms bring us together as a people of faith, as a worship community. They're not to be sung as an individual or private religion, but to be sung in community together as we celebrate the Lord. As Jean just read so helpfully for us, you probably noticed at the beginning of Psalm 103, the word bless, which we see seven different times in this passage, right? What does it mean? What does it mean to be blessed or to bless? Is it simply being satisfied with life or a state of mind that propels one into a future of contentment? Is being blessed a proposition that all people are searching for from all walks of life, a life of plenty, purpose, and destiny, state of being. You know, maybe it, for some of y'all, it's just been a simple salutation, right? Sometimes we say, be blessed, have a blessed day, right? A salutation as we come and go. You know, I remember when I was a kid, which was a while ago now, um, whenever I would complain about something, my dad would frequently tell me, listen, Chris, you need to count your blessings, son. I remember thinking, Dad, that that sounds great. I know I have a good life, but what does it really mean? Don't worry, be happy. Count your blessings. And who's the arbitrator of blessings, right? Who gets to hand them out? Or do, do we simply have a grab bag of blessings to take for ourselves in this world, maybe even by chance? We just work hard enough, take hold of them. We can compete with the world in a zero sum game of limited blessings. And maybe, you know, that last question makes sense to you because it seems like in our world, to be blessed is to be glorified in the sight of our peers based on our intellect or how beautiful we are or how great our recent travel history is maybe, how much money you make or stuff you have or your ability to earn money. Well, in Psalm 103, God answers a lot of these questions for us and defines what it means to be blessed. In Psalm 103, God commands His people to praise Him by reminding them of His eternal and unchangeable compassion for them and for all creation. In our passage for today, we find the psalmist celebrating and praising the Lord in three parts exhorting his listeners in the hymn to first praise the Lord for your salvation faith and all the benefits that you have associated with it. Praise the Lord for his merciful character. And finally, praise the Lord for his providential care and sovereign control over all creation. So now in in turn, as they occur within the confines of the text itself, first praise the Lord for salvation faith with all of the benefits that you get from that. Well, at the very beginning, we should know God does not need us to bless Him. I mean, at first glance, what we find in this text is this Scripture seems to be telling us that we need to bless the Lord. But we need to understand that God is absolutely and completely content within the confines of Himself as God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, in the three personages of the Godhead, they are complete and perfectly content in and with themselves. They don't need us or anyone else to bless them. And yet Psalm 103 commands us seven times to bless the Lord or bless His holy name. You know, in the Hebrew command here, it's, it's all in the stem form of what we call the peel, which is an intensive. It's not just like, okay, bless the Lord. It's bless the Lord. Bless the Lord in the text is what it said. Well, what does God do that He commands us to bless Him or to praise Him? What is He like that He would command us to bless Him? Well, the psalmist is going to help us here in Psalm 103. So let's look back at the text in the first five verses, starting in verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul. 
and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with everlasting or steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. You see, Psalm 103 was written by King David, and he was the king of Israel in about 1,000 B.C. or 3,000 years ago. And for those of you who are familiar with the Old Testament, you would agree that it would have been really tempting for David to be pretty full of himself, wouldn't it have been, when he wrote this psalm? You know, at the time of the writing, he was the king of the most powerful nation in the world. His people adored him. Those outside of the confines of the community that he was warring with feared him. He had many reasons why he could have been very proud of his accomplishments. And yet he's the one who writes Psalm 103, praising the Lord with his entire being. Because David believed the Bible was true, and the God, the God that's within it was real, knowable, and in charge. You know, can you just imagine our world if our leaders were so convinced that the God of the Bible was real, and they went to church every week and praised the Lord with all their soul? Can you just imagine that? That's what we got here with David in Psalm 103. Are you here today because you believe that the Bible is true? That the triune God that we find in his pages is real? Or are you simply looking for an experience that you can't find out in the world elsewhere? You see, in our day and age, many, if not most people, are looking for a spiritual connection with a force that stands outside of their common experiences, right? And for these folks, religion, for most of them, is a private matter often navigated by holding out for the opportunity to have a real encounter with a real or imagined God of their own choosing. You know, some people come looking for that experience at the fireworks, worshiping our nation, an OSU football game. Some come to local or foreign places of worship looking for the experience, right? Some look for God in nature. Kim and I are watching this reality television series uh, called Alone. I don't know if you've encountered this. There's 11 seasons. We're in season 10. It's an interesting program. Um, you know, what they, the, the premise of it is it's a reality television show. So they take these 10 people who are experienced in the outdoors and they dump them in the middle of the hinterland. This season, they're in northern Saskatchewan on this thing, these lakes. Uh, I mean, it looks like fun until you actually have to live in it for... By, <laughs> Uh, and so they're out there, and they interviewed one of the female contestants this year, the producers of the show, and she said that she was planning on going to college as she looks for meaning in life, but she decided not to because she found her, quote, personal religion out in the, out in the world in nature. You know, she had a number of these experiences as she was trying to contemplate what to do and what ultimate reality is, and out in nature, she said she found God, right? I found religion in nature. You know, and while can, we can find God in nature, the Bible tells us, we cannot understand who we are and be truly blessed by God apart from Scripture, which helps us understand ourselves as sinners and our great need for Jesus Christ to be redeemed by an all-powerful God. Right? Because you see, the main purpose of the Bible is not personal experience, but divine revelation. And when we receive divine revelation that only the Christian scriptures can provide for us, then we can have the experience that we all seek. And we find the only deity that deserves our praise and worship. You see, what the world needs and is looking for desperately is a church filled with confidence that God is real and has revealed himself in the Bible. A church that unmasks the attempt to find fullness in life in personal and emotional experiences and instead points to the God who is outside of time and space and informs our understanding of all of history. A church that cares about Scripture because it cares about the truth. 
a church in which its main goal isn't workability and personal practice as much as worship and praise of the Creator and Redeemer of all things. Are you here today, friends, because you think Christianity and the Bible are true? Well, the psalm writer David believed it. And it was because he trusted in the God who gave him the words to write Psalm 103 that he had an emotional experience and broke out in song. What's he doing here? He's worshiping the living God of the Bible with all that he is. Bless the Lord, O my soul. All that is within me, bless his holy name. He's not worshiping to find God, but praising the Lord in song because he's already found him in Scripture and in history by God's grace through faith, right? David's internally aroused from apathy to adoration in Psalm 103 by reviewing in his mind all of the benefits that he receives from the Lord. And he's using in his mind and his memory to ignite his emotions by recalling what he's already learned in the Bible. You know, God doesn't want us to sit around in misery, you know, wallowing in the challenges of life, of which there are many when we come to Him by faith. Nor does He want a lukewarm Christianity where His people are just kind of going through the motions and somewhat indifferent to all the benefits that they have in Christ. Well, what are the benefits that David praises the Lord for? Well, the first, in the text, looking back at the text, David praises the Lord for his faith. His salvation faith, in which he acknowledges himself as a sinner who is forgiven. You see, friends, David knows that all human beings are sinners since the fall in the garden of Adam and Eve when they disobeyed God in their pride. And the Bible tells us that because of this original sin, all human beings are conceived in sin since then, right? Born in, the sin, born in sin, born in the sin of pride and in the sin of guilt, and in the sin of forgetting all the benefits that we have from the Lord, the sin of placing ourselves in the place of God and worshiping ourselves and things that are created, we all suffer from that. The Bible tells us we're dead in our sins and trespasses, spiritually dead before God saves us. Salvation faith is a gift from the Lord. It is a gift from God that we do not deserve but are given by grace through faith. The psalmist helps us think rightly here because the Hebrew word for benefits means to humbly recall all the ways that God has dealt bountifully with David. You see, God gave the law of the Bible to the people of God in about 1400 B.C., 400 years beforehand, right? By His grace after He had delivered them from slavery in Egypt. And David... The author of Psalm 103 was the king of Israel some 400 years later, after the Exodus. And his Bible was the first five books of the Old Testament, which is what he's referring to here, right? He's like recalling the story in the Bible as he thinks about God's benefits from the, from the book of Deuteronomy. So you got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy is the fifth book of the law, as they call it, the Torah, which Moses delivered to the people as they were entering into the promised land some 400 years before. And Deuteronomy is kind of a summary. Deutero, Deuteronomy is second law. It means it's, it's kind of a summary statement of the first four books. And, and David, I think, is probably referring back to this text as he's thinking about these benefits. So in chapter 8 of Deuteronomy, starting in verse 17, the Lord warns us. He, he warns the people of God. He says, Beware lest you say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it's he who gives you the power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. To forget these benefits is to be proud with ears and eyes closed to reality. You know, don't we all have the tendency to do that? You know, see, there's, there's a danger in the Dublin life of plenty in which we might want to believe that we're the primary source of our well-being and wealth. You know, that in my mind and in my job and through my hard work and through my perfect work record, I've gotten all these things. I've gotten all these things. I've earned it. 
You know, I remember the first time I was engaging this text, and it's been a number of years ago now, from Deuteronomy, uh, and thinking to myself, oh my God, he, he gives me everything. Everything. Including the energy to get up every morning and go to work. This text says, not only the ability and the mind to do the work, but the very motivation to be in, try to be industrious. You know, in fact, my wife, Kimmel, she's over there. You can ask her later, but <laughs> she'll probably remember how many times, and sadly it's been many, that I bragged, you know, Kim, uh, I haven't missed a day of work in 20 years. In 20 years. Yeah. I haven't, aren't I tough? I'm a real tough guy, aren't I? You haven't missed a day of work in 20 years. That's brutal. You see, in our sin, even as Christians, we forget the many benefits we receive by faith in Christ, of which our motivation is one. God warns us against this pride in his law, and in that David's very familiar with in this passage. And yet, while God is quick to forgive us, he's often slow, it seems, in our judgment of time to heal our diseases and this is really hard for so many of us. You see, God has a desire to have a relationship with us of which sin destroys. So when he forgives your sin by faith, now you're able to have a relationship with him. But yet our suffering, we want him to relieve so many times, but it's a, not having suffering sometimes can be a barrier to our relationship with him. So we never know, right? Sometimes he heals us, sometimes he doesn't. His ways are higher than ours, right? Because he wants a relationship with us, and sometimes our suffering and diseases actually deepen our relationship with him instead of creating a barrier for it. And so while he does redeem our lives from the pit by giving us faith and the prospects of eternal life and a forever youthful state when Christ returns, even into the fruit of old age in the here and now, God has many benefits that it's sinful for us to forget about. David continues on with his praise by acknowledging now God's eternal character as he turns from his health to more broadly God's character in a, in a source for us to praise him in the second part of this text. Well, the psalmist has just told us what God gives us by faith in him, our salvation and many other benefits, including our health and our wealth. Now David's going to turn to God's eternal character as a source for our praise. What is God like that we should praise him? Who is he? Back to the text, verses 6 to 12. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor keep, will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. You know, now, I think most of us would agree that justice for all the oppressed in our day and age uh, has really become a kind of a slogan of many well-meaning non-believers. You know, but if people really wanted to know what God meant by it and why he said it, they would need to turn to those in the Scripture, to the narratives in the Scripture where he actually makes his ways and his character known. And, and that's exactly what the psalmist is doing here, isn't he? referring back to Moses and God's interaction with him and the people in Egypt and the desert on Mount Sinai. The psalmist is referring to what the Bible tells us about God's character, which informs why he cares about justice. You know, do you remember the story? God delivered the oppressed Israelites from their slavery in Egypt, and then he gave them the Ten Commandments. And so Moses goes down the hill in Exodus 33 and 34. He goes down the hill to deliver the Ten Commandments to the people. What were they doing? Do you remember? They were worshiping a golden calf that they had fastened together by the golden plunder that, that God told them to take from the Egyptians when they left. They were worshiping a golden calf. So what does Moses do? He takes the tablets and throws them down and smashes them, goes back up on the mountain to visit with Yahweh, and what happens? What did the Lord do? 
He showed Moses and the people his true character. By doing what? By giving him another copy of the commandments. And descending in the cloud, passing before him, he proclaimed his name in Exodus 34, 6 and 7. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. He cut two new tablets for Moses and dispatched him back down the hill to the calf worshipers. This is God's character, full of mercy and grace, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness and forgiving the sins of his people. What's he do in verse 8 here in Psalm 103? He's quoting Exodus 34, 6, and 7, God's character. Let me just say that these verses that describe the character of Yahweh are not only programmatic for all of the Old Testament law, but we've seen it here quoted, right, directly in the Psalms. It's also quoted directly in the prophets, law, Psalms, prophets, right? Exodus 34 is not just programmatic for the Old Testament, but it's programmatic for the entire Bible. It's all over the place that we see this text. And this character of God is exemplified most completely in the incarnation and work of the God-man, Jesus Christ, in the New Testament, right? As the gospel writer John says he's full of grace and truth. For Jesus came to earth to fulfill all the Old Testament promises of Yahweh in his steadfast love and faithfulness to redeem God's people from their sins. He doesn't deal with us according to our sins. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us by grace through faith in Christ as the promised one in the Old Testament. Fulfilled in Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world in the new. Which may be precisely why in Luke's gospel account, when Jesus is walking, he's been resurrected from the dead in, in Luke chapter 24. And he has this, this episode where he's on the road to this little town called Emmaus, which is like six miles from Jerusalem. And he meets up with these two guys who are walking. And they're totally bummed out because they're like, we thought he was a Messiah, but he's dead. And Jesus walks alongside them. They don't recognize him. What, what does Jesus say to them? Oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe. All that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself, do you see? The scriptures Jesus was referring to are the Old Testament. These texts, which, which the psalm writer is referring to right here, do you see? That's why you know, last week Patrick um, helpfully reviewed Wester, you know, our Westminster Shorter Catechism question and answer, what is God? Do you remember what he said last week? God is spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. That's what our catechism says. It's a lot. It's really helpful. If the Old Testament people, if David was asked, what is God or who is God, what would he say? He'd quote Exodus 34, 6, and 7. God is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. It's because of God's eternal character and his gracious and merciful character that he forgives our sins and satisfies us with all good things in Christ, you see. God cares a whole bunch about righteousness and justice for the oppressed. And the Bible tells us that God's justice is met and completely satisfied in his mercy as he offers salvation to the entire world at the cross of Jesus Christ. You know, the psalmist didn't have a view to this end. I mean, he wrote this about a thousand right? A thousand BC, a thousand years before Jesus was here, right? He never purview into this end, but he trusted Yahweh and his Bible and the promises of, of the coming Messiah, right? And we have the entire Bible now, not only the rest of the Old Testament, but the entire New Testament 
and the history of the church over the 3,000 years since Psalm 103 was written to be certain of God's unchanging character, right? You can feel the momentum building as Psalm, in this psalm as David describes the reasons for his praise of the Lord. And so David continues by acknowledging God's great love for him despite his finitude, his createdness, you know, his finiteness. Look back at the text, verses 13 to 18. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we're dust. For as man, as for man, his days are like grass, he flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it and it's gone, and its place knows no, no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. God shows compassion to his children, and he's compassionate to all those who come to him by faith. Right? God, God the Father knows us very deeply, and he cares for us very deeply as well. He's incredibly empathetic to just how frail and weak and um, you know, finite we are in our createdness. God knows us better than we even know. You know, and isn't this a helpful way of thinking about our God and for praising Him? You know, for those of us who have children, you know, we can affirm that it brings us tremendous joy when our kids realize uh, how much we truly love them. I remember thinking, you know, when I was when I was in high school, I remember thinking my my dad was a little old and kind of out of touch. Like, come on, really, Dad? You know, and then I went away to college, and I was amazed in the first two years of my college experience just how much my dad learned during those two years. <laughs> I was amazed. Man, are you in college now? You're learning so much. Even when we disagreed, even when he forbid me from doing some of the things that I wanted to do, many of the stupid things, right? He did so because he knew better. He cared, he cared a lot, and he really wanted the best for me. And that's kind of the point here, I think. God's not too old. His Bible is not an anachronism. It is not out of touch. He does know better than we do. He wants us to follow his commands because he loves us, do you see? And you know what? For many of us early on in our faith, you know, we might think that God's commands and his laws are old, out of touch. Don't we need to like rewrite the Bible? One friend of mine told me recently. Like it's, it's just old. It, it's not helpful. And um, so I was thinking of that, of course, here, right? It's not too old. It's not out of touch. It is timeless truth. Like we might feel like we know how to navigate life better than God does. And in his steadfast love and faithfulness, he wouldn't have something helpful for us to teach us and to command us to. As we mature and grow in our grace, we come to find that God actually really is smart, isn't he? And he loves us. He loves us so much we can trust him and depend on his ways. David knows that God's a good father, perfectly holy God, who knows best and deserves to be obeyed in the fullness and steadfast love for him. And isn't that true for us too? You know, it's easy to follow somebody that we trust, that we know who loves us, that we know is way smarter than we are and has our best interest at hearts, right? Isn't it? I mean, it's, it's easy to follow that. Do you believe me? And you know, even, you know, I mean, I've failed so many times as a parent. It makes me sad and convicted a lot of times. And all of us have. I mean, you know, there's no perfect parent, but God is a perfect father. You see, he never fails and deserves all of our worship and praise. So who should praise the Lord? Well, you're probably saying, sounds like, you know, if you're a believer, you should praise the Lord. And I would say, amen and yes. If you're a believer, you should bless and praise the Lord. But it's interesting, the psalmist doesn't stop there in this text as he gets to the end of Psalm 103, does he? He goes further by suggesting that all creation should bless, bless the Lord in the third part of this text. Look back at the text now, uh, verse 19 till the end. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules all over. 
or over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. You know, this adding this part of the text is really an important text uh, step for us as, as Christians, isn't it? For the triune God of the Bible, friends, is absolutely sovereign and in control over all that comes to pass over in all the heavens and all the earth. He loves his creation, and he plans to redeem and restore it when Christ returns. There is nothing that is outside of his purview and control. There's a sense in which every occurrence of every day in every nook and cranny of this world, creation cries out and should cries out, praising the Lord, saying, you are the king. Nothing happens by chance. Because chance is a nothing. It doesn't even exist. It is nothing. And giving power to something that doesn't exist might give some in the world an explanation, but it isn't a logically tenable one. God tells us here that he's in charge over all the heavens and all the earth. In all places, he is in dominion. And if you're a Christian, friend, that is a very, very good thing and should provide you with a tremendous amount of hope when life seems pretty hard. Because we know who God is and how the Bible describes him. He's the God of steadfast love and faithfulness, mercy and truth, which means that he can be trusted to always do the right thing. And that every occurrence of every day in every setting is purposed for his glory and his great love for his creation and his people. Yet despite his sovereign control, despite his all-encompassing power and dominion, he invites you all of you, into relationship with him by grace through faith. Don't you want to share in that blessing? What's holding you back from coming to him today and worshiping him with all your heart and soul? And, you know, if like so many of you already know the Lord, how, how, are, you, how, are, you, how are you going to respond to Psalm 103 if you already know and love the Lord? Like the prophet Elijah told the people in Israel some 200 years after Psalm 103 was written in about 800 B.C. when bad king Ahab and his just horrible wife Jezebel were in control. The people were just kind of floundering around. Remember what Elijah said? Or asked, how long will you go on limping between two different opinions? If Jesus Christ is truly who the Bible reports him to be, the fullest and most emphatic and perfect expression of who God is in his character, full of steadfast love and faithfulness, who died for you and in the power of his spirit is resurrecting you right now from the dead, if that's true, worship him. Friends and visitors, praise him and bless his name with every ounce of who you are. You know, when I look out, I just had the opportunity to. Y'all were singing so nicely this morning. It's helpful. You look out and you see people praising the Lord and emptying their hearts to Him. I look up and I see Paul, the worship director, and our musicians. It doesn't just benefit you as an individual. It benefits all of us when we praise the Lord together in the assembly. It's not a private, religious, emotional experience, you see. When we truly bless the Lord with all that we are, He blesses all of us. Even those in the assembly that haven't come to faith with Him. Faith in Him. You see, when we bless and praise the Lord, we extend the fame of Jesus Christ to the watching world and to each other, which is a very good thing. Notice how David, let me just close with this, notice how David comes full circle in this psalm. He starts out, by praising the Lord and blessing Him for His salvation, faith, and the benefits. Then he goes into God's character and blessing the community. Then he goes all the way to all of creation should be blessing the Lord. What's he do here in the very last half of the last verse? He comes full circle in his response and in our application. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless His holy name. Amen. Amen.